turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, and Lord willing, we'll read from verse 1 all the way through to verse 8, and then we'll see what the Lord would speak to us tonight in His Word. James chapter 1, starting at verse 1, reading through to verse 8. We're going to do a little bit of background work again tonight on this epistle in the book of James, and we are recording actually these, these midweek sessions in the book of James. So if you feel like you missed anything or you didn't quite get all the content, uh, I'm told they'll be uploaded uh, on Friday on our YouTube channel. You can go and find that and uh, that will be a great resource to you. So James chapter 1, starting at verse 1, reading through to verse 8 and it reads like this. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. My brethren, Count it all joy when you face when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Book of James, the letter of James, is probably, there's very little doubt about this and a great deal of consensus, is the oldest New Testament epistle that we have. It's the first one that was written and it was written for a very distinct purpose by a very distinct personality. It was interesting as we spoke about James in recent times, we talked about the particular and unique perspective of this particular James, there's several in the New Testament, but this one being James, the Lord's half-brother, this one having a very unique perspective and how, just how incredible that perspective is for the ministry of this person, James. In fact, it was just the other day, I was at, on campus at the local university here, and a few of us were sharing faith. And a number of times I was speaking to people about the claims of the gospel and the claims of Jesus Christ and the, and the veracity of Scripture and the necessity of repentance and faith in Christ. On more than one occasion, probably because I was studying to prepare to speak in James, I had the opportunity to speak to someone who was an unbeliever, a, a skeptic, a doubter, and explain to them just how profound it is that we even have a New Testament epistle by one of Jesus' brothers, especially when we recollect as we go back to the Synoptic Gospels and John's Gospel, we look at Jesus' brothers were not supporters of Jesus' ministry. And none of us need to be perplexed or flummoxed as to why that's the case. Those of us that have brothers can imagine what it might be like one day for an older brother to suddenly have something of a, of a snap and now begin declaring himself to be fully God, the Messiah sent from heaven, miracle worker, and Savior of the world. And Jesus' brothers were not particularly sympathetic to this new career choice of Jesus. And on more than one occasion, they tried to talk him out of it. On more than one occasion, they, they gave warning. They, they told him, this was going to end badly for you. This is going to end very badly. You've got to stop doing this. And, and when they couldn't convince Jesus to, to give up this whole, new, this whole new idea of his identity, they came to him in, in, in a mocking sense. You can read it. We're not going to go back and look at it tonight. You can read it in John chapter 7 where it talks about Jesus going down or, or readying to go down to the feast in Jerusalem. His brothers came to him and said, Hey man, why don't you go to Jerusalem? Why don't you go and show yourself? Why don't you go and prove yourself? I mean, it's all well and good to do your miracles and your, and your tricks and your illusions here among the primitive people of Galilee and Nazareth. Go to Jerusalem. Go to the professional theologians, go to the, the priests and, and the workers of the temple, the Levites and the Sanhedrin and see if you can conjure up a, a following. They were mocking him. They were facetiously demanding that he would go and prove himself in Jerusalem. Of course, we know the story. Jesus went to Jerusalem and did, in fact, very much demonstrate himself to be who he claimed to be. As I was having this conversation on the local college campus and I was telling this story, I was I was interacting with the, with, with the young people I was sharing with and I was asking them, what would you feel like if you had a brother that started to espouse this kind of an idea? How would you respond? Would you be immediately skeptical or would you be sympathetic? And every single person without fail said, I would step back and distance myself and, and try and get my brother admitted into some place with padded rooms and mind-bending medicine. I would do something to get him helped. Now you've got brothers. I can see many of you nodding like, yep, yep. 
And so we think about this scenario, and as I was sharing faith and trying to evangelize to these, these skeptics, I, I said to them, it was so grim, this, this division between Jesus and all he claimed to be and all he claimed to do and all his miracle working power and his teaching and his own brothers. The division was so stark and, and so intense that when it came time for Jesus to be crucified, none of his brothers were there. His mum was there but none of his brothers were there. I, I asked these, these skeptics as I was sharing faith, I said, you think about your sibling, brother, sister, no matter, no matter what they've done or how bad it's got or how, how badly you may have been rejected or abused by them, ask, answer me this question. I asked them, I said, I said, if one of your siblings was going to be executed for crimes against the state, do you think you could spare some time to at least be there? Every single one said, I'd turn up. I mean, after all, it's family. And I, I began to pose the question to these skeptics. I, I asked them, I said, no, no, seriously, like, like what kind of a crime would your sibling have to do that you would refuse to carve out some time to go and be there on execution day? Whatever you think that might be, and maybe there is no such crime that would, that would forbid you or, or, or give you no impetus to go and, and be there on that day. Jesus' brothers were so put off. In fact, you can imagine them, right? You can imagine James and, of course, Jude, who wrote another New Testament epistle, you can imagine these brothers hearing of the news that Jesus has been arrested, that the capital punishment has been handed down, that he's going to be executed by Roman authority. You can just picture James finding this out and just kind of slumping his shoulder and saying, I told him that was exactly how this was going to end up. I told him that if you, if you march around and, and proclaim yourself to be divine and Lord and holy, Lord of the Sabbath, God incarnate, you, you declared yourself to be, to be existent before even Abraham was. You declare yourself to be the great I am. You say these things. You can imagine James just feeling frustrated that his, his, his prediction had come to pass. It was, it was grim. None of his brothers chose to be there. None of his brothers, we have any, any evidence, were even anywhere near Jerusalem, even though they knew how this was going to pan out. What's significant as we turn to the book of James, chapter 1, verse 1, is we have rank skeptics, unbelievers, deniers of all Jesus claimed to be. I said to these two, uh, these particular two young men that I was sharing with, I, in two different conversations, this came up, the experience of James. And I said to these young men, I said to them, what would, what would have to happen if all this occurred in your family? It was your brother. Uh, he made these claims to be fully God, divine in human form. He was executed for, for crimes against the state. You were so frustrated and angry and disappointed. You didn't even turn up on execution day. What would happen? What would need to have happened to you for you to then publicly write a very, very submissive statement and say this, James a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's changed? What changed from these siblings who refused to even be there at a distance looking on to offer some kind of moral support to this statement of great submission and condescension? A bondservant. Some of your translations just say servant. I prefer bondservant. The Greek word is doulos, slave, slave. James goes from skeptic, denier, frustrated brother. He told Jesus to cut it out. He didn't listen to saying, he is my Lord. He's my Lord. I said to these, these skeptics that I was sharing the gospel with on university campus, I said, the only thing really that you and I or anyone could, could come up with an explanation for such a radical change is if the claims that Jesus made not only to be fully God, and he made that claim, not only to have authority over the inanimate objects of nature, and he made that claim, not only to claim to have authority over diseases, and Jesus made and verified that claim, not only the claim to have authority over the demonic world and, and, and satanic hordes, and, and he claimed that and demonstrated it, but to have power over death itself, to be able to say that you can destroy this body, and after three days, I will raise it up again. The audacity of that claim is, in fact, quite stunning. Because if you are dead, then, ready for your mind to be blown, you are dead. D-E-D, -E -D, dead. That's, that's where it's at. 
So in order for for Jesus to say, I'm going to die and in a state of death, I will still very much be alive and sovereign and Lord and all glorious. And that death that I died, I will overcome because I am the author and the prince of life. You remember when we studied this recently about the experience of James, we, we asked the question, we don't know, we don't have any scriptural literature on this, but what would that first conversation have sounded like when Jesus appeared to his brother after the resurrection? What would, that have, what would that have been like? What, what could Jesus have said? Now, I have brothers, so I can imagine how I would say it. Something like, didn't I tell you so? Right? Didn't, didn't, didn't I say this? You didn't believe. Remember, you, you mocked me. You slandered me. You rejected me. But here I am. Because I'm everything I claimed to be. James writes this epistle, and he writes it as we see the the dedication, the, the address here in verse 1, and we're not going to rehash all of the content we've studied of recent times in this book of James. But it says to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. And we, we began to try and understand what prompted James, who goes from skeptic, not only now to be believer, and he now is very much a believer, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, but from that state, James is elevated to a place of great prominence in the church at Jerusalem. Galatians chapter 2, Paul will actually call James a pillar of the church. Now, James doesn't belong to the original 12 apostles. James wasn't initially commissioned by Christ to to be an apostle, as we understand Peter and, and the other John and the other James and these other characters. James comes late in the piece, but is quickly elevated to a place of prominence. We know that as we, as we looked at in recent times in Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem Council, when the great dispute arises over Gentiles that come to faith in Christ, how much, how much Judaism ought they to imbibe and, and begin to live out in order for them to consider themselves genuine, genuine faithful followers of Christ? Do they need to be circumcised? Do they need to keep the regulations of the Sabbath? Do they need to keep the Passover feast and regularly attend the temple in Jerusalem? Must they do these things? The Jerusalem Council met to settle these issues. And on the one side, it's a group of people that we know of as the Judaizers. And we know of the Judaizers, not only because of the accounts in the book of Acts, but because they're the reason we even have the epistle to the Galatians. They're the ones that Paul is addressing, who he calls them out as being those who are preaching another gospel. We looked at this Sunday morning in our study in Hebrews, and we emphasize this as strongly as we could, that there is no addition to the work of Christ. His work is sufficient, final, and it is all-encompassing, and it is all entirely able to save to the uttermost those who place their trust in Him. But what's stunning at the Jerusalem Council recorded in Acts 15 is when these two warring parties, on the one side Judaizers and on the other side you've got Peter and, and Paul and Barnabas who are talking about how God just keeps saving these Gentiles and filling with the Holy Spirit and they're speaking in tongues and churches are rapidly being planted and cropping up and, and James stands up and he settles the debate. All mouths fall silent when the bishop, as he's called, Bishop James rises and begins to speak. We understand that when the persecution blew out in Jerusalem after the stoning of Stephen, you want to reference this, it'd be Acts chapter 8 verse 1. It tells us that the entire church was scattered abroad all over the Roman Empire. Now we know that at the day of Pentecost, Jerusalem has ballooned in size because it's one of the major Jewish festivals on their religious calendar. So just like at Passover when Jesus was crucified and now at Pentecost, thousands and hundreds of thousands, some historians will say millions of pilgrims come from all over the Roman world to be in Jerusalem at the time of Pentecost. And that's when God pours out His Holy Spirit and brings about the the manifestation of His church. And so now this Jerusalem church is ballooning in size. Day one, 3,000. A few weeks later, another 5,000 converts. Some historians will say we've got a church of tens of thousands. Some even audaciously say 200,000 people. Now, I have no way to verify that. We, don't sim- we just simply don't know. But what we know is once Stephen was stoned, there was, a, there was a taste for blood in the detractors and the antagonists in the city of Jerusalem. And all but the apostles spread. 
So if you can picture it, these, these two major moments in the Jerusalem church, there's Pentecost, when thousands gather in Jerusalem, hear the gospel, receive the, the great news of salvation, and they sell everything they have because they're not going back home anymore. They sell their properties, their homes, their businesses, and they stay in Jerusalem to worship and be with the church. It's the only church. If you don't like the preaching style, this is it. If you don't like the color of the decor, there's nowhere else to go. So these people are so, they're, they're, they're so adamant that they're going to commit their life to the community of faith, the only one on planet Earth that they sell it all and they live in some kind of, some kind of commune type lifestyle because they belong together. But then the Lord, by His grace, brings about that incredible moment where Stephen is stoned and he gains the victory in faith. And all those people that have been gathered, the thousands, spread. They're scattered, as it were, to the winds. And so we, we've read this, but let's, if you've got a Bible, go with me to the book of Acts chapter 11. We want to see this again so we get a, we get a sense of the context of this great epistle. If you'll go with me to Acts chapter 11, the verse, let's start at 19. It reads like this. Acts 11, verse 19. Now those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. That was the status quo. We need to understand that. That was basically the... The MO of mission in that day was to preach the gospel Jews. No one understood or had a, had a sense of why or how God was going to convert Gentiles. The Jerusalem council hadn't occurred yet. But then we read this in verse 20, but there were some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. News about this reached the church in Jerusalem. They sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. So when we turn to James chapter 1, we've got Jesus' brother, a very eyewitness to the resurrection of Christ, convert, servant of the Lord and Savior Jesus, bishop in the church of Jerusalem, the, the overseer, the pastor of the church, with the apostles. The church in Jerusalem a mass and an immense crowd is now scattered to the corners of the Roman world. And there they are. And this is, what, this is what believers do when they're scattered is they live holy lives and they proclaim the gospel. Now, this, you, need, you need to read and understand this is, this is not a, a mission strategy. The Church of Jerusalem didn't sit down with a committee and map it out and, and go through a timeline and, and, and dictate goals and vision. And they did none of that. They just had one of their deacons stoned and thousands of scattered. And wherever they went, they preached. And whenever they preached, souls got saved. Churches started to blossom everywhere. Now, these churches didn't have duly ordained elders, so to speak. They didn't really know how to ordain deacons, so to speak. They didn't, really have, they didn't really have much understanding of how to function as a healthy Christian church. Remember, there's only ever been one at this point. So James writes them a letter to encourage them, to educate them, to help them. Firstly, to understand the purpose of being under trial and how wisdom is so imperative to live a life of Christ-likeness no matter where you are and no matter how your context is, whether there's great strain of trial or whether there's great triumph and victory. So as we go to James chapter 1, we come down to verse 2. And verse 2 reads like this. In fact, let's read, let's read a few of these verses together. My brethren, James writes, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So the first thing we need to realize is that the majority of these people, this dispersion that James speaks about, my translation says, those who are scattered abroad, that the majority of them have already undergone severe trial. They understood that Stephen was stoned. Probably many of them were there to see the events take place. 
That the moment Stephen was stoned, a young man in Jerusalem at the time, Saul of Tarsus, took him. He appointed himself as, as a very much a self-appointed leader of the riot and antagonism against the Christians to go into their homes, to pillage their belongings, to throw them in prison, and Christians fled almost overnight. They knew what it felt like to be under the acute strain of trial and tribulation, pain and suffering. So the first thing James wants to do when he writes to these dispersed, these scattered abroad, is to encourage them what's the right way to respond under trial. You can, you can picture James in Jerusalem. Now, of course, I, I've made the joke recently. It, it bears making again. James is not going to be the guy to write your church growth manual. He goes from a church of maybe 40,000 people to about 13 overnight, and no one's going to invite him to teach at the seminar anymore. No one wants to know how he did that. So there's James, once with his ballooning, immense mega church, now sitting down and thinking, where are my people? Where are they all gone? How are they all faring? Are they, are they being firm on their conviction of Christ and their faith in him? Or are they wavering? Are they struggling? Are they beginning to have doubts? Are they beginning to throw it in? Are they keeping firm in their faith? So he says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Some of your translations say, count it pure joy. The CSB says, count it great joy. This is, this is a staggering way to start off a letter to a group of people who have already undergone the severe and acute trials of the riot in Jerusalem. Hey guys, hope you're all really happy. I feel like I feel like if I was writing this letter, and this is by no means my attempt to improve upon James, he's inspired by the Spirit and he's vastly more wise than me, but I feel like I want to tread a little bit more lightly leading up to, are you guys happy? Like, like I feel like James is just straight into it. You guys need to count it all joy. He's of course not saying the trial is joy. That pain is joy. This is, not, this is not some kind of positive self-talk to recreate a reality that's not even anything like reality. This is James telling them that you have suffered. You will continue to suffer in the Christian life. There are few things guaranteed to a Christian in this hostile world. One of them is persecution. Paul writes to Timothy, those that desire to live a godly life will suffer persecution. So James wants to remind these believers, these ones who were members of his church, most likely to count it joy when you fall into various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. This is staggering. And the reality is, this is staggering a thing to say to people who have already undergone tremendous pain, the loss of goods, many of them the loss of family members, some of them the loss of limb or eyes or ears as the persecution was so violent and bloodied that few escaped barely with their life intact. Count it joy. Count it sheer joy, one translation says. Count it pure joy. Count it great joy. But James doesn't just suggest that as some some reincarnation of stoicism, like, like life, life stinks, but you just got to pretend that you're happy and you'll probably be okay. That's, that's not James's philosophy. And that's helpful to nobody. No one goes to the funeral, walks up to the family of the recently deceased and says, you guys should just try and be more happy. That's not, it's not helpful. That's certainly not James's point. He says, the testing of your faith produces Patience, or, or other translations will say, and rightly so, endurance, steadfastness. Here's, here's the reality, and I, I, I want to be direct and honest about this, that, that much of Christians today in our generation, in our world, of our very coddling systems of Christianity, we're often one deep heartache away from turning a good God into a tribal capricious deity. That's the nature of the way we live. One author says it like this. He says, many Christians are one punctured tire away from rank atheism. Now, I know we don't want to put our hand up and, and admit this, but most certainly our generation today has, especially in the West, has lost something of this counting it joy 
Because we, we kind of imbibe this mindset that if things are going well for us, we must have somehow pleased God today. And if things are going poorly, we, we kind of retrace our steps in our mind and wonder where is that little sin or that, that little failure of duty that is provoking God to be so capricious toward me. That's not the Christian faith. That is certainly the faith, as I said, of tribal deities that are capricious and need to be won over by petty sacrifices and orders of duty. But that's not the Christian faith. As we said earlier, there are a few guarantees of Christians living in this hostile world. One of them without doubt being that there will be suffering. And it isn't just, as I said earlier, this is not just a command to have a stiff upper lip for the sake of it. But in order for us to have this joy, now note that's what, that's what James encourages. He says, count it joy. Count it sheer joy, pure joy. We need to have what? Wisdom. We need to have the wisdom to know, and this is, James is going to continue to speak this, that if you lack wisdom, you need to go to God and pray for it because he gives liberally and without reproach. This is, this is, what it, this is what James is driving at, that we need to have the wisdom to understand that pain is better than imperfection. Let me state it again, because I genuinely believe that this is something that has been vastly and overtly lost in much of modern Christianity. That pain is better than imperfection. James says, count it sheer joy pure joy, great joy, when you suffer various trials because your suffering produces endurance, steadfastness, patience. In other words, we all have a lack, a, a deficiency in who we are and how we live and how we reflect the perfect image of Christ. And God uses trial, He uses trial to produce in us greater conformity to the image of Christ. And that, to the wise Christian, is sheer joy. Pure joy. So, let me state it again. I want you to get a sense of this. Wisdom says, it is better to have pain than imperfection. It is better to have sore affliction than sin. And agony is better than than rebellion. Now, we know that this is the New Testament witness. The author of the Hebrews says and encourages those Hebrew Christians, says to them, you have not yet resisted sin unto blood. That, that to all of us, each and every one of us, there is, there is a point that we have to stop and make a, make a dedication to this truth. That whatever comes our way, whatever struggle and suffering and pain and affliction happens to us, we will not compromise our conviction that Jesus is Lord and Savior and Redeemer of our souls. That's tremendously important. So James says, if you are wise, you will understand that pain is God working in you to produce greater conformity to the image of Christ. If you are not wise, then when pain comes, affliction comes, you will interpret it as God being displeased at you, hating you, fighting you, cursing you, and that's not the reality of the God of the Bible. Let me, let me come back and, and say what I've been assuming this whole time. Let me state it explicitly. That for those that are in Jesus Christ, Lord willing, all of us are. If you are not, tonight receive Him as your Savior by faith the gospel of grace. For those that are in Jesus Christ, all of our failure, our sin, our misdeeds, our slip-ups, whatever other, whatever other synonym you like, it's all punished entirely in Jesus. That is extremely important because a lot of the times the reality is we have the temptation to suffer and then wonder, what did we do to offend God? What did we do to get, to get God on our bad side? What did we do to anger this capricious tribal deity that we've superimposed over the person who is the all-loving, all-glorious God? As Christians, there is no judicial punishment in our life because it's all entirely absorbed in Christ at the cross. It doesn't mean that God doesn't chastise the children He loves. And that is a distinction that I suspect many believers have not actually thought through 
and applied to their life. It is so easy for us when we sin, when we slip up, when we mess around and we fail God to be holy as we ought, it's easy for us to then sit back and wait for the tsunami of God's wrath to come. It's like, it's like we have this built-in innate sense, of, innate sense of karma that we kind of live by, that we've messed up, God's going to curse me, and I just, have to, I just have to cop it and just be okay with it. James says, count it joy. That's not what's going on here at all. James is saying that God is so loving. God loves us so much that He not only gives us Jesus, and He does, and gives us salvation in Christ, and He does, but He gives us conformity to the image of Christ through the process of affliction and suffering. In order for us to have this joy, we must first have the wisdom to know that pain is better than imperfection. James isn't saying pain is good, pain is fun, that somehow we've got, to, we've got to become masochists in our thinking and we've got to become, I don't know, sadistic and just enjoy the feeling of pain. That's not what he's saying. He's saying when you know that the pain that the Lord brings into your life is producing in you greater holiness, endurance, steadfastness and patience, then you can count it joy. You can be overjoyed, not in the pain, but overjoyed in the work of God through you to bring about holiness. Agony, tribulation, and pain teach wisdom because we discern the effect after the fact. What this means is often what happens is we go through a trial, we go through a, a, a moment of pain or affliction, and in that moment, let's just be honest, we don't often obey James 1. We just don't often obey this. We don't stop and recollect that this is pure joy. We often get angry, we get disappointed, we get frustrated. That's human nature. But after the event, we're able to look and see how that trauma produced in us the patience and endurance that the Scripture promises we ought to have. But if we can know this, this is what James is encouraging, in the time of trial, or better yet, before the trial, we can make up our minds to know by conviction that pain is coming. Pain is coming. All you have to do is keep breathing and you'll suffer. And if you choose to stop breathing, you're already suffering. It's coming upon all of us. And if we can make this conviction, our decision to know that when it comes, we're not going to relish in the pain, but we're going to know that God will use it to make us all the more wise and perfect in grace. Look at the text again. Verse 2 and 3. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So what this is saying, now I know it says perfect and complete, and there are those believers that, that, that seem to, at least on the surface, believe that they're perfect and sin-free. I've never met one that would live consistency with that claim, but it's not saying morally perfect. It's not saying affliction will actually make you holy, exactly like Jesus was holy, in whom there was found no sin, no guile, no rebellion. It's talking about a complete, a, a, a fulfillment, a, a total con transformation and confirmation to the image of Christ. This is not a promise that if you suffer more, if you suffer more pain, you can be more sin-free. There's a basis there for medieval practices of self-flagellation and things of that nature. Like, if I can just suffer more pain and whip myself harder and bleed more, I'm going to be more sin-free. And the person who did this found themselves sorely disappointed, not only because they'd brought upon themselves all this suffering, but they're no less a sinner than they were the day before. James is telling us that we can be conformed, complete, without any lack. This is what pain produces in us. This is how pain prepares us. Let me read you this quote by a great theologian of the, well, of the, the English Reformation era. William Gurnell wrote this. He said, So many go into the field against Satan, and so few come out conquerors, because all have a desire to be happy, 
But few have courage and resolution to grapple with the difficulties that meet them in the way to their happiness. Like it is innate to us as humans to have this inbuilt desire to be happy. That's natural. All humans in a, in, to a degree have this. But we have to be resolute. We have to be ready to confront trial and tribulation and count that trial joy because it will produce in us more wisdom, more holiness, and of course, thus always happiness. If we can know and brace for pain before it comes and we can be reminded during the process of trial to count it all joy for the right reasons, then we can be wise. But I wonder as we're sitting here this evening and thinking about this, and I don't know about you, but I know when I think about this, I just know, I just know the way I get when pain comes. Like pain always has a surprise element to it. it doesn't matter if you've suffered it before, to go through it again always has this overwhelming sense of frustration. And James is here to remind us that we need this wisdom. We need wisdom and we need it the most in those times of affliction when we just cannot rally ourselves, stir our emotions and our thoughts towards saying, this is joy. And James anticipates that. It's almost like he knows how the original recipients of this epistle are going to hear this command. Count it all joy. Count it sheer joy. Count it great joy when you're suffering and he can almost hear the scoffs of the people. Like, really, James? Are you for real? James knows that in order to think this way, there must be wisdom. So verse 5, James provides the means of attaining it. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Pain produces in us God's grace, God's glory and conformity to Christ. James is not saying, let's state it again, that the pain in of itself has to be reinterpreted as joy. James is saying we ought to be wise enough to know when affliction and various trials come, they're producing endurance, steadfastness, patience. They're making us complete. But if we're struggling to not not to believe that because we can see it in the Bible and so believing it's not the hard part, the, the hard part is feeling it when pain comes, then James says wisdom is what's lacking. And where there's a lack of wisdom, there is always the means of prayer to be used and calling out to God to say, help me to not only believe this God, help me to feel this. Help me to know this. Help me to apply this to my experience, my life, at the moment I need it the most, when I'm in the thick of various trials. James says pray. And he says to pray a certain way. And that way we ought to pray is in faith without doubting faith believing we read this in verse 5 this is what we ought to believe that God gives liberally and without reproach that the God we're praying to is not some capricious tribal deity the God we pray to is omnipotent all glorious all mercy and all love and he loves to give liberally he loves to lavish on his children the things that they ask for. He loves to over abundantly pour out in their life the things they only ask for a scintilla of. This is what it means. He loves to give liberally. He's always going to pour into your cup until it is overflowing if you've asked without doubting. Not only does he give liberally, but without reproach. God's not the kind of parent He gives you a good thing, and as he's giving it, it comes with a scornful remark. Some people here had parents that were like that. They they weren't amiss in giving good things, but whenever they did, you always kind of made to feel guilty about it. You always kind of made to feel like you were heavily in your parents' debt, or you you owed them something, or or somehow by receiving this gift, you'd, you'd somehow rob them or afflicted them. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible loves to give liberally, 
and without reproach. When God gives a gift, it's a free gift. It's granted by grace. It's paid for in Christ. It is yours freely and entirely yours forever. That's the gift and calling of God. We need this wisdom. When we read that first command of James to count all trial joy, we should all have a moment where we look at that and say, I don't know if I can do that. I know the Bible says it. I'm just not sure if I'm up to it. And James says, we need wisdom. And when we ask for it, God is already standing ready to grant it. You can't, you can't catch God off guard. You can't surprise God by your request. You can't go to God and say, Lord, I need some wisdom. Him to say, really, you? I mean, I know the other guy needs some. I never thought you'd be coming asking for wisdom. I know when I go to God, he's like, yeah, you should have been asking for this a while ago. I'm certain of it. I need this wisdom. I don't, I don't go into trial and pain and affliction and stand back and say, thank you, Lord. You're perfecting and completing the image of Christ in me. I don't do that. I struggle to believe any of us do. Why don't we do it? Is it because we're sinners? Well, not necessarily. It's because we're unwise. It's because we lack true eternal perspective. It's because the reality is, although the Spirit leads us to think this way, our flesh wars against it, and we just struggle to have perspective. James says, God is always at the ready to give liberally without reproach, and it will be given. But ask in faith. Don't doubt. Don't second guess. Don't question God's goodness. Don't question God's stores of liberality to pour out wisdom in your life above, beyond all you can ask, think, hope, or imagine. Don't doubt God. Doubt yourself. Doubt your prayer. Doubt other people. Doubt the systems of the world. Don't doubt a good and holy God. The one who does places far more confidence in themselves and in their own thinking than they do in the self-revealing infinite God of Scripture. And God considers it an affront and that's why James says, if you're going to ask this way with this kind of second guessing, doubting, like, like, God, I need wisdom. You know I need wisdom. Please give it. You're probably not going to give it. God considers that a reproach on himself. God considers that a, a way of mocking him. And that's why it says that the person who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. They're They're unstable. They're without any certainty. They, they, they have no basis or grounds for confidence. The person who's like that, let them not suppose they'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. What I love about verse 7, and we'll close out on this thought. What I love about verse 7 is the word suppose. That's what I love because what verse 7 is actually indicating is that God, in His grace, mercy, benevolence, and all His goodness, God is better to us than what we deserve, infinitely so, nothing new there. But also, the person who doubts, who questions God, who's skeptical of God's goodness and his liberality, that person ought not to suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. But you know what often in my experience, and I'm sure many of us are like this as well, is that God still often gives. The text does not say that the person who doubts, God's going to shut up the bars of heaven and say, you, sir, are cut off. No, it, it doesn't say that. In fact, experience will tell you more times than not, when you've prayed like this, doubting, struggling, recoiling in on yourself, questioning God's goodness, when you've prayed, don't put up your hand, we've all had moments where we've prayed like that. What we're told in Scripture is not to suppose that heaven will answer that prayer. But heaven often does. God's graciousness, His goodness, His benevolence overwhelms and is well beyond even our greatest doubts. And that's what's important about this word in verse 7. Let not that man expect. Let him improve the way he prays. Let him rethink the nature of the divine being who has opened up heaven and said, come willingly, come freely, come boldly, come often to the throne of grace and make your petitions known. That's what God has said to you. But the reality is we rarely come as we ought. We rarely come as confidently and boldly as we ought. We rarely come expecting as we ought. And James has got a very sharp reminder for us that when we treat God like that, 
we ought not to suppose. He's not saying God won't give. Your experience must be like mine. Sometimes even my prayers that are simply littered with the greatest of doubts and skepticism in my own flesh and frustration, even them God answers. Even them God answers. And that's why it says in verse 7, don't let that person suppose they'll receive anything, which is no, that's a no-brainer. They're already doubting. They don't suppose they're going to receive anything already. But God is at the ready to grant wisdom. So that, verse 8, the double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. What's God's antidote for the double-minded man, unstable in all his ways? God's antidote for that person, which too often, far too often than we're willing to confess, might even be us. God's antidote for that person is affliction. So that we can let patience and endurance and steadfastness. These are antonyms of being double-minded and unstable. God will grant affliction so that we can be complete and perfected in every way according to His good will. This is the wisdom of Scripture. This is how it reads that you and I would know that all pain that God brings into our life is for our betterment, our improvement, and our growth. And so we have this luxury to count it all joy. Would you go with me to the Lord in prayer this evening? Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, that you are so gracious, infinitely more gracious than we could ever deserve. And Father, what this means so often is when trials come, when tribulation and affliction comes, we're often quick to point our finger at heaven and, and, and blame and accuse and get angry and frustrated. Father, the reality is many of us have got stories where pain has come and we've chosen to distance ourselves from you and not run to you as we ought. We do lack wisdom. We've shown ourselves to lack wisdom. Some Perhaps more than others, Father, that's certainly true. But the reality is, this is such, a, such an alien command to count trials as pure joy. Father, would you help us to be wise to understand, to be wise to apply, to be wise, Father, to be resolute even now. Some of us right here now listening to this, listen to this exposition of James, Father, are in the midst of great trial. Would they be reminded of this? That you are working through it for their good. You're not angry at them. You're not trying to lash them. You're not trying to punish them judicially. You're trying to bring about in them the image of Christ. And that is joyous. Holiness is happiness to us, God. And yet because we lack wisdom, Father, you've called us through your word to pray for it, to ask for it, to not doubt in our request of it. Because the doubting person is double-minded and unstable. And that person needs affliction to become stabilized and steadfast and endurance. Help us to be wise, God. Help us to pray with the faith that wisdom brings. Help us to know, God, that you give liberally without reproach. That you are so good. Father, you are definitionally good. And we ask you in Jesus' name to bless this word to our hearts. By your spirit, Father, apply it to our life. And may Jesus be lifted up and glorified. We ask this in that name, his name, the name above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. And all who agreed said, Amen and Amen. 